Good morning. In today's programme, what makes a father? The gay sperm donor who helped out a couple of lesbian friends and is now being chased by the Child Support Agency. Monica Galetti is the rather fierce chef who judges the professional master chef. She'll be preparing a dish from her native Samoa. Next in our possible candidates for the Women's Hour Power List, who are the powerful women in business? And from Rio de Janeiro, the music of Flavia Coelho. Now, as I'm sure you've heard in the news, there has been widespread disquiet and there have been a number of demonstrations in both Ireland and London about the fate of Savita Halapanova. She's the young woman who died late last month in a hospital in Galway in Ireland. She was 17 weeks pregnant, had been taken to hospital in pain and was told she was having a miscarriage. Her husband says she asked for the pregnancy to be terminated because she was in so much pain, but was told there were signs of a fetal heartbeat and abortion was refused. It said she was told it was because Ireland is a Catholic country. Well, the fetus died and was removed, but Savita died two days later. She developed septicemia. Kitty Holland is a journalist for the Irish Times who's spoken to Praveen Halapanova, Savita's wid widower, and joins us from Ireland. Kitty, what did Praveen tell you about the condition of his wife when she went to hospital? Well, uh, he told me that she had been in um, a lot of pain overnight. It was a Saturday night and that they presented at Galway University Hospital at about 9am on Sunday, the 21st of October, with uh, back pain. But apart from that, she was well and healthy. Um, the, she, the, following an internal examination, it was established that her cervix was fully dilated and that her waters were broken. And she was 17 weeks pregnant at the time and she was advised, sadly, by the obstetrician on duty that she would inevitably lose the pregnancy. And what did he say about her asking for a termination? He said that um, they were told at that Sunday morning that it would all be over in a few hours and that she was admitted to hospital as a patient. But it um, it continued and on Monday morning, um, in an awful lot of pain and obviously emotional distress as well, Savita asked could, if the fetus was unsavable, could they please um, um, expedite the situation and... Um, and deliver the fetus um, and they were told that in effect that this would be a termination of the pregnancy and that in Ireland because there was a fetal heartbeat that this would be illegal that their hands were tied and they were sorry there was nothing they could do. But why if she was miscarrying anyway were signs of fetal heartbeat so significant? Well, because um, under Irish legislation and in guidelines to doctors, the first sentence in the guidelines are abortion is illegal in Ireland. And then there are circumstances set out um, vaguely that uh, the, an abortion is legal where there is a threat to the health as distinct from the life of the mother. Um, and that they are the only circumstances now. Doctors obviously have to make a call when that um, it's the life as distinct from the health and doctors fear being hauled before the court. So one must surmise that there was um, a judgment call made that the fetus was still alive and that it would have been illegal for the doctors to intervene and effectively kill the fetus. Might they not have anticipated what happened in that with an open cervix, she developed septicemia and that did kill her? Well, that's what a lot of people are saying and indeed that is what the husband is saying and that is what the husband's family, a lot of whom apparently are medical um, practitioners themselves um, back in India and they're apparently absolutely perplexed, flummoxed and furious that uh, she was left effectively three days with an open cervix, um, fully dilated. Um, but th at, at that point we can only speculate until the um, there's a report, an inquiry going into what had happened, but uh, we can only speculate that they must have made a judgment call that uh, her life was not in danger. How accurate is the claim that she was told this is a Catholic country? Well, um, Praveen, her husband, um, has told me that this was said um, with other people in the room at the time and he has said it repeatedly in interviews. Um, he apparently said it to uh, a very close friend uh, just outside the ward when he went out to speak to him who's also a doctor working in Galway um, and he corroborates that. So uh, until we hear otherwise, we I suppose we must take their word and I suppose we have to be open to the... Uh, 
possibility that it was not said in a hostile, you know, you're in our country now kind of way, that it may have been uh, a shorthand way of explaining in a very emotionally pressurised situation, in a shorthand kind of way, what the situation is in this country. Um, you but know, how why has, their hands were tied. How has the comment been interpreted in Ireland? Because well, I know there were a lot of people demonstrating in Dublin last night. I mean, there have been demonstrations in London as well. Yes, and uh, demonstrations planned in other cities and, and a big one of demonst- planned for Saturday in Dublin. Um, it has been taken to have been a, a very insensitive thing to say to a young couple who aren't from this country. And I th- actually think, on reflection, that the reason this has taken off as such a huge story across the world is possibly because she was not an Irish woman and she was told this you one might infer you're in our country and this is the way it works here and that Irish laws Catholic laws have been imposed on an Indian Hindu young healthy woman and uh, the fear is that this may have impacted on the eventual devastating outcome. Now I understand the Irish government has been looking very carefully at these kind of cases, what impact is it going to have on the government's view? Well, the the government is obviously under enormous pressure now to clarify what the legal situation is here in the Republic. Uh, It's very vague, as I say. It's it's up to doctors to decide when the life as opposed to the health. There's no further guidelines and there's pressure on the government to enact or introduce legislation to clarify just when... um, abortion is legal. Uh, the, the government is a two-party government here. It's a Fine Gael majority, a Labour Party minority, and th- uh, split down the middle. Fine Gael is uh, mainly pro-life and has said in the past that it would not countenance the introduction of legal abortion in Ireland. The Labour Party is an avowedly pro-choice party, and elements within it would feel that the issue of uh, a, the right to choose is absolutely seminal, fundamental, political a part of their being. There, and, there has been an inquiry which they, they've just received a report on? Yes, there's a, there was a all-party c- committee appointed last November to look at this issue. It submitted its report to government uh, on Tuesday night. Quite coincidentally, the whole story of Savita's death uh, broke on Wednesday morning, so it couldn't have come at a worse time for the government because I'm sure the government, which is not popular, uh, would have liked to have uh, really kicked this to touch if it could and to do as little as it could about it. But um, the pressure is enormous, international as well as um, within Ireland, to finally do something about this. This has been going on for decades. Kitty Holland, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. Now, if you watch MasterChef The Professionals, you will now be familiar with Monica Galletti. She's the woman who sets the contestant a task. Last night they had to butcher a duck and has no truck with any sloppiness or incompetent. She has a book out, Monica's Kitchen. She's head sous chef at Michel Rue Junior's restaurant Le Gavroche and her background in cooking is Samoa, where she was born and lived until she was seven. She then went to New Zealand and came to the UK in her early 20s and today she cooks the perfect ceviche. Monica, what's the origin of ceviche? Well, Jenny, you know, um, there's there's always been an ongoing sort of uh, discussion or or argument over the years of the originality of the ceviche, which uh, some claim is from the Southern Americas, and uh, we say it's from the Pacific uh, Islands. Well, you would. Uh, Of course I I would. I called it Samoa, (laughs) and I know I should call it Samoa, shouldn't I? You you said it perfectly. My rugby friends tell me. Ah, I see. Now, the recipe in your book calls for stone bass to be used. I'd never heard of stone bass stone before. Stone bass. Where do you get it? Stone bass is a, is a family of the, of the sea bass. And uh, I think, you know, a few years ago, um, originally sea bass was getting fished out of the ocean by so much demands from the chefs. So stone bass become very popular. And I, I believe that, you know, I think stone bass, you know, they, they bring one fish to replace another one and the same sort of situation happens. Um, is now beginning to get overfished as well. I love the texture of it, but if you can't get stone bass, sea bream is, is, a, is a wonderful alternative and it's also very cheap as well. OK, so what we're talking about is pickling this fish 
but very, very quickly. Yes. How do you start? It's very simple. Um, you know, it's not quite pickling. It's, it's sort of curing it. You know, there's, there's no vinegars used. We use lemons and limes. And this is the original ceviche. Um, even in, in South America, they use limes and, and lemons to cure it. So it does sort of cook the fish quickly. And you don't want to be leaving it in the fridge for hours and hours because it will just turn white and you see it. So if, when we do it, we do it, you know, 15, 20 minutes before, leave it in the fridge and bring it out five minutes before you're ready to eat. Okay, go on. You've right. got a piece of fish there. I do. So the first thing I'm going to do is... I'm taking on your bossy quality, aren't I? Good I like heavens. it, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I think the only woman I get on with a bossy woman. <laughs> so do feel free to ask me any questions. So the first thing I'm going to do, you see here I have the, the fillet of fish. Um, you can ask your fishmonger to bone the fish for you. And, and I think the very important thing with making a ceviche is the fresher the fish, the better. Um, you know, it's something you're eating raw, basically. So you want it very fresh and that way minimise the, you know, uh, the possibilities of, of making your guests ill. Would you get the fishmonger to skin it as well or would you do that yourself? I do it myself. Look, it's so easy. All I'm doing is I'm holding the skin of the fish like this. I'm just going to slide the knife under and just pull the skin towards me. I'm not moving the knife at all, OK? And all I'm doing is just pulling the skin towards me and it's off. It's as easy as that. You can do this. Yeah, but you're good at that. <laughs> <laughs> you I can leave the knife for you, Jenny. <laughs> so what you want to do is you don't want to be eating large chunks of raw fish. I'm going to dice it up, small cubes, OK? OK, so it's in small cubes. It's just small cubes, just like that. And how do you start the... The curing process, I won't say pickling process, <laughs> that was wrong. All it is, or for me anyway, is some lemon or lime juice. Squeeze some over it, mix it through thoroughly. I add a bit of the zest as well, I toss it around and I leave it to rest and that's it. It's as easy as that. And then what do you add? I, yeah, I've got one here that you clearly prepared earlier, um, which was very clever of you. <laughs> um, and it's got tomatoes. Yes, I've got tomatoes. Cucumber. In no, it. there's celery. Oh. And spring onion, you know, people tend to use shallots and that, but where we're from, we use spring onions. And it's, it's more a delicate flavour, I find. Tomatoes, and it's lovely with the crunch of the celery through it, as you're going to see when you try this amazing dish. I've just tried it. You've just tried it. And it's really, really <laughs> lovely. But there's a distinct coconut flavour Yes, in there. as I say, it's a, it's a slight twist, and I think this is the best way to do it. Um, from the islands, we like to add coconut cream to just about everything even raw fish <laughs> so slicing the lemon the lemon slicing juice the lemon. Goes on first that's right squeeze the lemon on okay we're going to mix that through and we're also going to put some of the zest through if you get a fine zester you just grate some of it you can smell it through the room it's delicious just while you're doing that, I mean, you, obviously you came here. I know you got your job at, at the Gavroche and went on to marry the sommelier. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a child I who's do. six. How do you and your husband manage to look after a child along with the very long hours that inevitably come with being in a restaurant? Excuse me, I'll just pour some water in there. Um, it's a balancing act, and I think... You know, I think initially when we found out we were pregnant, we went into shock. <laughs> um, more so myself than my husband. But, you know, she's the best thing that's happened to us. But I wasn't ready to stop my career for her. Um, and I don't think at any point in life I'd like to say, listen, I gave up what I love doing to look after you um, sort of thing. So I want to be able to do both. Um, so would normally, if I'm at work, hubby would do the, the school run in the morning. And then I'll race home in, in the evenings and, and pick her up. Um, for example, I'm here today, so he's had to, to do the school run. And just one other question, because you, you're, you're now chopping up the tomato. You know this rudeness that people <laughs> accuse you of? Yes. Rather fierceness that you have with these people. Is that theatre for the show, or do you really think that they Have deserve... you seen me on there? Yeah. Am I rude? Yeah. Am I? <laughs> Bit. <laughs> you're you know, fierce. Um... You know, I'm a chef, and, and I think at a certain level of cooking, you don't put up with any sort of rubbish from, from anyone. And the standards are so high, the pressure is on. Excuse me. Um, is that an excuse? I, I, don't, I don't think so. 
uh, what I do is, is very tough. I've got 17 lads to, to, to look after. And at any point in the day, if I'm going to say, excuse me, if you don't mind, can you just chop that a little bit smaller so the customers are not going to choke on it? And do you mind sort of wiping that ball with the blood all over the side? Only when you're ready. No, it doesn't work like that. You know, and, and Michelle is, expects perfection all the time. And my job is to make sure that happens and he doesn't catch it. Because if he catches me out... You know, I'm not doing my job. Well, you have done, I have to say, you have done your job perfectly here. I just need to ask you, how long would you leave it to... Uh, I keep using the word pickle. Sorry. That's all right. Please do. Uh, how <laughs> long, once, once the, the lemon and the coconut juice and the vegetables have gone in, how long before it's edible? I, I would leave it, you know, maximum 15 minutes just for all the flavours to develop before you can eat it. Um, you know, Samoans or where I'm from, you know, they'll happily put what's left over in the fridge overnight and eat it again the, the next day, which is fine. But I think, you know, because I'm in the industry and I understand more about how when things sort of go very soft and the textures you lose, I'm a bit more fussy these days. But well, Monica, I love it. Your ceviche is very, very good. Thank you very much indeed Thank for you. preparing it. And let's just mention that the recipe, of course, is on the website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. Now, still to come in today's programme, more on the power list. Who are the powerful women in British business? And the music of Flavia Coelho will will be performing live. Now, throughout last week on Women's Hour, we heard extracts from the blog of the Pakistani schoolgirl, Malala Yousafzai, who was shot in the head by the Taliban for campaigning for girls' education. Well, tonight on Radio 4 at half past 11, you can hear Malala's diary, a chance to hear that blog in full. Asma Mir will also be reporting on Malala's progress and exploring the impact of what happened to her on the lives of girls and women in Pakistan. Now, in 1998, Mark Langridge, who was living with his partner in a gay relationship, was asked by a lesbian friend, also in a relationship, if he would help them have a child. He agreed to be a sperm donor by the Turkey based method and believed they'd agreed he would have no paternal responsibility for any child that came about as a result. Well, a girl was born later that year. Then in 2000, a second girl was born by the same method with the same agreement. In June of this year, he was contacted by the Child Support Agency and asked to pay his dues as a father. Well, I spoke to him earlier this morning. Why did he decide to donate his sperm? Well, she was a friend, and um, me and my partner had got to know her, and talking to her over the months, it just seemed like a nice thing to do. She had a desire to be a parent. I had no desire to be a parent, but I could easily make her dreams come true. So it seemed, you know, so easy to do it that there was no real reason I could see why not to. What sort of legal advice did you have about it? Well, back then, late 90s, there was no internet to speak of, you know, no access to the sort of information we take for granted now. The only thing I did, the only thing I could think of doing, was to speak to a friend of mine who is a solicitor, and she said, well, you could draw up a document between you, but there would be no... Uh, it wouldn't stand up in court. And her advice was, even if you did it, you know, what would be the point sort of thing? If, if you hadn't done it, what was her alternative to try and get pregnant. We're talking 13 years ago. Well, just to keep asking, I think. Just to keep asking around. Maybe. How likely would it have been, say, if she'd tried to go to a clinic? Well, and... I get, I, it's my understanding that back then in the late 90s, that would have been pretty much closed off to a lesbian woman or even a single woman. Official sperm banks would only see couples who were having problems conceiving. So she had no option, really, but to seek a private donation. Now, Mandy was quoted in a, a newspaper as saying you'd agreed to share being a parent. In your opinion, what terms did you actually agree? The agreement we had was that there would be no financial or parental obligation or commitment on my part. I was quite happy to see the children as, you know, the children of friends and to be, you know, sort of involved to a certain extent. Me and my partner would go and see them if there was an occasion, like a gathering, a barbecue, or just a Sunday afternoon round at their house. And we would just go as part of the crowd. What feelings did you have for the girls? Well, like any children, you know, friends, it's a happy thing to be around. I mean, after Mandy fell pregnant with the first one, we didn't see her at all until the first child was born. She just, you know, she said she was quoted as saying she thought it would always be one big happy family. Well, we weren't contacted at all, apart from when she said, I am pregnant, 
that was it until after the child was born. So she certainly didn't want us around during the pregnancy. And then it was always at her sort of beck and call. She'd ring us, oh, you know, some friends are coming over. Did you want to come over for the afternoon? And me and my partner would go. All of a sudden, the girls were saying, daddy, daddy, daddy. Well, that wasn't a decision that I had any part in or, um, you know, a conversation that I had with their mother. But I know you had taken the girls out with your partner. Well, that was later on, yeah. And, and your parents, I know, I know your parents are separated, but, but they had also visited them. They had, yeah, they had a little bit of contact. Yeah, I mean, it's me and Mandy were friends. Me, my partner, Mandy and her partner were all friends, and there's two children around. Obviously, I'm the biological father. You talk to your parents about what you've been up to. My parents knew the situation. They, you know, wanted to meet the girls, and you know, but it was always at Mandy's behest. But how naive was it, Mark, in retrospect? to contribute to creating two lives, enjoy some of their childhood, involve their grandparents, but have no responsibility? Well, they had two parents. My argument is there was another parent there, a full-time parent who was in every way involved in those children's day-to-day lives. Now, my understanding is that Mandy says she and the other woman were not permanent partners. It was just a temporary arrangement. What's your... Well, understanding of what was going on. Though. Her partner, Jackie, was always around. If I'd have had any doubts, I wouldn't have got involved. She came across as someone who was sorted, in a relationship, and financially sorted. How much are you expected to pay by the CSA? At the moment, they've said £26 a week, which sounds quite small and quite petty, but it's because I'm on very low income. I'm self-employed. I'm trying to get more work, like we all are. If my work sort of load and my earnings went up, so would the contribution I'd have to make. It's a proportion, a percentage of what you earn that they want to take. So what do you want to happen now? Well, I want the law to be addressed. The fact that they've changed the law so that now a lesbian and a single woman can go to an official sperm bank, so therefore any donation would have a bit more protection. They've also, it's my understanding, in the case of a private donation, uh, there is more protection for the donor as well. So somewhere along the line, in these intervening years there's been a decision reached that both of those things were wrong and had to be addressed, that the fact that a a lesbian woman would have no option but to seek a private donation and the private donor would be liable have obviously been put right. All I want is that to be applied to my case. Mark Langridge, we did, of course, ask the mother of the children, Mandy Baker, to give her side of the story. She declined. She's engaged Max Clifford as her agent and is due to appear on a television programme. So what is... A father, at what point do you become liable for child support? And what would happen now if a man were to make a similar kind of agreement with a friend? Well, Lara Vitians is chief executive of the National Gamete Donation Trust. Natalie Gamble is a lawyer who specialises in the issues surrounding fertility treatments and joins us from Southampton. Natalie, what does the law say about the position of someone like Mark? Well, the law is very black and white, and uh, essentially, if you're the biological father, then you are financially responsible, unless you fall within one of the very clearly defined categories of being a legal sperm donor. Um, And those are that you have either donated your sperm through a licensed clinic or that you have donated to a couple who are either a married couple or, nowadays, also a lesbian couple who are civil partners. Um, And if you don't fall into any of those categories, you are the legal father and you're financially responsible. Lara, how many more cases do you reckon there may be like this one? There are thousands of cases of people who have donated this way or have received this way, but when it comes to relationship breakdown, which ultimately this is, we have no idea. So, so Natalie, if someone like Mark, did exactly the same thing now, making a private arrangement, no lawyer involved at all, just nothing written down at all, what would his position be now? Well, it would depend entirely on the status of the people he donates to. So if he would donate to a lesbian couple who were in a civil partnership, then they would both be the legal parents of the child. So they would share financial responsibility and he wouldn't have any responsibilities at all. If he were to donate to a lesbian couple who were not in a civil partnership, then the position would be the same unless the donation had happened through a licensed clinic, which, as Mark said quite rightly, is is possible now in a way that it wasn't 13 years ago. Well, now, civil partnerships, Natalie, were introduced in 2004. Mm-hmm. Um, the law was changed, as you say, in 2009. 
how likely is it for Mark to get some sort of retrospective amendment? Well, I mean, it's very difficult because obviously any retrospective amendment is going to affect a lot of people who kind of went into arrangements on the basis of a, a different law. Um, and our law here, you know, in other countries they have um, law which defines parentage based on what people intend at the outset, but we've never taken that approach here. We have kind of quite clearly defined rules about who the parents are. Um, and so it would be quite difficult, I think, to amend our existing law because it would create a situation potentially where anybody who's a biological father could say well I'm not responsible because I was just acting as a donor so there need to be quite clear boundaries and you know the boundaries that have been agreed are the ones that, that I've just been describing um, and it would be I think difficult to apply that retrospectively unless we change the whole framework so it's kind of on the basis of what people are agreeing at the outset but again then it would have to be very clear what was agreed there would have to be some kind of formal agreement I'm sure. Lara what impact could this case coming to prominence have on future donations? As Natalie says, I think it's highly unlikely that they will change the law because so many cases are involved. But w what will happen is, I hope so anyway, that it's, it's a warning to, for people who intend to use a sperm donor or indeed sperm donors to seek legal advice and be absolutely sure how they do it. The best is still going via a licensed clinic because then you can absolutely be sure about not just the legal status of the donor and indeed the children who the parents are, but also some some medical checks and, and genetic tests, which clearly with an uh, uh, informal arrangement as this is, is not happening. Um, and it's protects the patients as well because the reverse case could also be true and we've seen that happening is that donors actually then want to have access they from the outset they think they don't want access to the children all of a sudden feel that they have a connection there then go to the mother and um, the patients are actually find that they are in a position that they don't want to be in. Why though I mean people must be aware that there may be complications that can arise from this and yet people are still doing it they're still making informal arrangements why yeah, i you know i don't understand i mean you mentioned what an eft that's ultimately what it is as well relationships between people do break down and what i find astonishing is that you need a signature for a library card nowadays but when just because it's an easy process especially with um informal donation it can be done easily of course uh, people take well, it lightly well as mark explains well, absolutely and and because it's done so easily and you can do it you know in the privacy of your own home people take it very lightly and that's something um we need to warn people about how conscious natalie are you of people still doing it in, informally and what's your theory as to why they might do it? I think there are lots of reasons why people do it. I mean, sometimes it's to do with the cost of going through a fertility clinic. Sometimes it's because if people are in a lesbian relationship or they're single, they don't actually feel they have a medical condition and they need medical treatment. Um, and sometimes it's because people want to know more about the donor than would be possible through a clinic and perhaps for him to even have some involvement. Um, and we, we deal with a huge number of private sperm donation arrangements. And it's probably worth saying that these kinds of cases where things go horribly wrong are not a big proportion of them that are you know a lot of people go into arrangements and everything actually works very well um, and you know as long as everyone remains in agreement the legal issues that are underlying it don't necessarily cause a problem but there is a risk if you go into things without the protection of the law so I think the most important thing is for people if they choose to do that for any of those reasons I've just mentioned are very clear about what the law is that is underpinning their situation so they understand that if you know people fall out then things could go very horribly pear-shaped. So just to reiterate, if a, if a couple came to you, not a couple, but a man and a, and a woman who wanted to do this but were not a couple, what would you say absolutely vitally they must do before embarking on an informal arrangement? <laughs> well, it all hinges on what you've done before conception. So if you want to have a situation where the donor is not the legal father, you either need to, the couple need to register as civil partners if they're in a lesbian relationship, or everybody needs to go to a clinic and register and deal with the conception there. Um, it's also a good idea to put in place an agreement or at least think about the kinds of issues around what kind of roles everyone's going to play and is the donor going to be involved in any way so that there is absolute clarity about how things are going to work. I mean, as Laura mentioned, we deal with cases as well where things have gone wrong because the donor actually wants more involvement than the mothers are, are happy with. And in those situations, it's really important to make sure everybody's clear about what everybody wants, because if there are mismatched expectations, it can be a recipe for disaster. Natalie Gamble and Laura Vitchin, thank you both very much indeed for being with us. And so, again, to the Women's Hour Powerlist, and today we turn 
to business. Who has power in the business world and of what does their power consist? Well, Heather McGregor runs a headhunting company, is a columnist for the Financial Times and the author of Mrs Moneypenny's Advice for Ambitious Women. So, Heather, who are the powerful women in your own field headhunting? Because you're selecting people for pretty big jobs. Yes, we are. I mean... Um you know, I'd like to think I'm one of them. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> um, but for my money, the, the most powerful and influential woman in headhunting is somebody called Jan Hall, who runs her own company called JCA. And I would say she was probably either directly or indirectly behind the appointment of almost every major board position in Britain. Really? Yes, because even if she's not doing the search, she'll probably be advising one of the candidates who will go to her for careers advice. So, you know, one way or another... I suggest that this woman, who, by the way, is you know, immensely likeable, very modest, um, you know, you wouldn't recognise her if you walked past in the street. And you wouldn't even know her name. Uh, no. And, you know, a single parent. Um, everything about this woman is to admire, and she's probably one of the most influential women in Britain. So, apart from her, who would you say are the most powerful women in business in general? Uh, well, I think they are the people who can affect how whole industries move and how things change. Uh, as you know, I'm a founder member of the steering committee of the 30% Club, and that's led by Helena Morrissey, who is the chief executive of a medium-sized asset management business. And it's not her chief executive position that gives her power. Um, it's her ability to mobilise a large groups of us that have helped take the rate of appointment of women on boards from 12 and 100 to 48 and 100 in only two years. Now, I call that power. It's certainly influence. Who else? Who else would you say is really powerful in business? Um, I would say that the, 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 um, Dame Fiona Reynolds, who's just stepping down as the head of the National Trust, people don't think of the National Trust as a business. It employs 55,000 people and she only pays 5,000 of them. It's very difficult to get people to come to work for love. Okay? So that's, that's pretty influential. But that's because most of her workers are volunteers. Yes, yeah, most of her workers are volunteers. You know, 90% of her workers, Jenny, are there out of personal commitment, not for money. Um, but the reason that I think she's particularly powerful is not just because of that, is because she controls 700 miles of British coastline, 300 of our most important buildings. She's the largest landowner in Britain. How influential do you think she is? And you know what? She's, she's retiring now after 12 years. She's been replaced by another woman, by Dame Helen Gosch. And, you know, she will now be one of the most influential people in this country. The, the tourism industry, after our financial services industry, is the second biggest earner of foreign exchange in this country, and people do not come to Britain for the weather. Now, what real impact do you reckon women have in the boardroom on the way business gets done? In the boardroom? Well, I think we have to split it a bit here between non-exec and exec people in the boardroom. There's still a tremendous problem with exec appointments. You know, it's a tiny number still of people. And I do think a lot of that is around women making the choice not to be there rather than a big male conspiracy. You know, we all know that, um, you know, doing anything, you know, requires focus and commitment. You don't win a gold medal at the Olympics without giving up a lot of your social life and alcohol and so on. And you don't get to the top of business without making sacrifices. Um, and some of these women have chosen not to make them. And I can completely understand that. Uh, but... With non-executives, I think that women in the boardroom are asking better questions, are representing a wider diaspora. I mean, if you, for instance, run a retail company, the chances are women are most of your customers. So why not have them? And Marks and Spencer is a very good example. You know, Robert Swannell is an enlightened chairman. You know, more than half his board now are women. And I think that's very sensible. And yet, still, there are not very many at the FTSE companies. No. Why so few there? Well, as executive directors or as... Oh. Yes. Um, again, I just think it's, be it's because women have looked at what the cho at the moment what the choices have to be and have thought, you know what, that's not for me. I want to choose to give more time to other things. And it might be their children. It might not be their children. It might be, you know, their quality of life. I always say to people, be careful what you wish for. If you are at the top of a public company, everybody will publish everything about your compensation. The Daily Mail will publish pictures of your houses. You know, is this really what you want? Now, Monica Miller, who's the Minister for Women and Equality, spoke yesterday um, about quotas. There's been a lot of talk about quotas recently. She says she's opposed, and she says, actually, we're doing quite well already. Are we? 
Yes, we are. The, the, the rate of appointment, as I said, has gone from 12 and 100 to 48 and 100 over the last two years. Um, the, the actual board composition in the FTSE has gone from about 12 and a half to 17 and a half, which doesn't sound like absolute massive change. But if we carry on with the change in the rate of appointment as we are, the next time I see you, Jenny, more than half of the last 100 appointments will have been women. You reckon? I do. I'll put money on it, actually. I'll put money on it. And uh, that's because, you know, these women exist, but we need to bring them to people's attention. I, I was reminded of this yesterday. One of the women in business that I think has been immensely influential, um, who I bet you no one's ever heard of, is called Chantal Cody, who, well, she runs a company called Rococo Chocolates, and she set it up when she was 23 years old 30 years ago. And she was really the, the, the founder of the British artisan chocolate movement, you know, long before anybody had posh shops in Elizabeth Street. So I think that someone like that who can change the way that the nation eats, you know, they're very influential and powerful. What does it actually take to get there, to focus. be in business? Just focus. 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 I mean, there are lots of ancillary things, you know, like actually having being you know you might be a great uh, cooker of chocolate but you need to know that you need enough cash flow to pay the rent for the shop you know so you need a certain level of financial literacy you need a certain level of social capital uh, you need a certain level of human capital i mean i think it's it's very sad that still three quarters of mba students are men um but uh, at the end of the day set all of these things to one side focus heather mcgregor one of the most focused women I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Heather, for Thank being you, with us. Uh, and don't forget, uh, you are to keep sending us the names of the women you'd like to see on the Women's Hour Power List. You can do it through the Women's Hour website and we will be passing those names on to our panel of judges. Thanks, Heather.